Hey, July 16th in the year of the plague, 2020 record cases, numbers of cases across the United States. We're all hoping that the lag time until deaths register demonstrate that we've learned how to cope with the virus and these end up being where hospitals are reaching capacity in various places, not deaths, but recoveries. I think we're going to see that. We pray we're going to see that. We won't know until next week. Kurt Schleicher is going to be in for me next week. It's my long summer vacation before the rush. But uh, last night I got the call from MSNBC for time in a long time. Hey, come on and talk about politics. It was Steve Kornacki who was sitting in in the 7 o'clock hour where eventually Joy Reid is going to take up residence. And Steve wanted me to talk about presidential politics. Five polls came out yesterday, all of them bad for the president, right? They were uh, uh, on average down 9.5, but the uh, NBC poll has Biden up 11. The CNBC poll has Biden up 10. The Quinnipiac poll had Biden up 15. The Economist poll had Biden up nine. Rasmussen had Biden up three. And of course, the Sunday Express uh, on Sunday, a week back on the 7th, had it tied. You, you really can't tell, but that was the number one subject of conversation between Steve's, Early and Maxwell, and myself. Here's the first take I had on it, cut number 16. Oh, sure. Uh, he's down nine and a half in the five polls released today, the average. And I would suggest that uh, you were the one to say to me on the radio, go back and look at Dukakis Bush in 1988. And uh, Michael Dukakis was ahead 17 points on July 22nd, 1988. There are some outliers in his favor as well, like the Sunday Express, which has it tied and Trump winning in the Electoral College. But assume it's nine and a half points down right now. I think yesterday's Rose Garden was the beginning of a campaign that will be sort of relentlessly one-on-one interviews they do miss the rallies. I think he is hurt by the rallies. But that Rose Garden message, uh, particularly the closing stark contrast between what has happened in Venezuela in the last 20 years and the economic recovery that uh, Trump promises will happen, then the president says, look, I did it once, I can do it again. He's got to continue to make that uh, message in every setting. So he's doing at least one or two one-on-one interviews per day, a lot of them on television, a lot with uh, print reporters. I hope he goes to radio soon. And I think he drives home that message and tries to uh, dominate the airwaves in the way that Bill Clinton used to do in 96. Dole never got ahead of Bill Clinton like this. But I think everyone in the, in the business realizes he's behind. He is behind. In fact, the president realizes he's behind. He fired his campaign manager yesterday. Not really. Brad Parscale still with the campaign. But Bill Stapien has been promoted. That's Governor Christie's political guy. And he had been the political director at the White House. He's been put in charge for the last uh, four months. Uh, Cut number 17. We come back around again to the the campaign. Here's my point. Yes, I I think so. And in in fact, I think that the economy and people's looking forward is going to be so significantly different this time around than it was when George H.W. Bush lost in 92. There was a referendum on an actual recession caused by policy that occurred in the spring of the election year. Here, everybody knows why we have hit the economic wall. And everybody knows we need Moderna or AstraZeneca to come up with a vaccine. Our therapies have to be successful. If the flatten the curve works a second time around in California and the uh, underlying uh, uh, epidemiology comes through to support where the virus spreads and why, and the president can make the persuasive case that the blue-collar boom you just referred to, Steve, that was there in January is because of his deregulatory efforts and because of his guiding of the economy— He will speak to individual voters in, you know, I think it's a three-state election, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Republicans are trying to put Minnesota and New Hampshire into play. Democrats are trying to put North Carolina and Arizona into play. The Texas stuff is kind of laughable. But I think it may be, maybe it's an eight-state election. But he has to target the voters in those states. And Zerlina may or may not agree with me that there's an opportunity in the African-American community. But I think the president has an opportunity to significantly increase his numbers on the security issue. In that community, I, I, I think it's so far away from being not just decided, but even not fluid, given the unprecedented nature of this circumstance. Not only social media, not only the coronavirus, not only the economic collapse and the coming rebound, but also the appearance of the, the Chinese Communist Party as a legitimate global threat on the order of the Soviet Union back in the 1980 election. All bets are off, Stephen Zerlina. That, that, that's what I think. I think all bets are off. Anyone who's saying that Biden's nine and a half point average lead 
Uh, well, you'll hear how I, I remind people about it. L- last cut, number 18 from last night on MSNBC with Steve Kornacki and Zerlina Maxwell. Here's my last take. It used to be. I think Vice President Biden was a much better candidate four years ago than he is now. And Hillary Clinton really was the worst possible nominee to run against Donald Trump. But the vice president's ability on the campaign trail this year is still very much up for grabs. And on the shy Tory, that's the term that we invented when John Major won an upset victory. That's not the model I'm looking for. I'm looking for the Brexit model where Dominic Cummings went out and found three million new voters. And I'll tell you, Steve, I grew up seven miles from Pennsylvania. I don't believe that number today. I talk uh, weekly with Selena Zito on my radio show. Western Pennsylvania is deep red. And Joe Biden and whoever is running it is, whether it's Val Demings or Kamala Harris or whoever it is, they are going to be anti-energy and anti the thing that has brought Pennsylvania back. So I think Pennsylvania is the is the keystone of those three states. I think Western Pennsylvania is the keystone of the keystone. And I, God forbid it's down to the Steelers fans, but that's what it looks like to me. And that's how I left it. That's how it looks like to me. The whole country's future depends on Steelers fans. And uh, that said a shudder through your back of your neck. Look, the uh, president gave a great speech yesterday. I'm going to start. But first, let's go to the Oval Office spray he gave yesterday. Uh, he sent in the Oval taking questions. Cut number one. Well, radical left wing politicians have fought to open borders and welfare for illegal aliens. My administration has fought for safe streets. We want security for our people. We want the rule of law. We want law and order. In the last three years, ICE has deported over 16,000 gang members and arrested over 2,000 members of MS-13. Think of those numbers, 16,000 and arrested over 2,000 members of MS-13. We've also deported a lot of the MS-13s out of our country. This week's actions by the Joint Task Force Vulcan is the most recent offense to, we really, this has been a big offensive in my administration's war on foreign gangs, of which we came into this administration and we said, what's going on? We had gangs from countries that you wouldn't believe. More than 20 of the criminals we indicted and arrested in the past seven days were illegal aliens. Yesterday, for the first time ever, the Eastern District of Virginia, thank you very much, indicted MS-13 leaders on charges of terrorism. So we have the MS-13 leader on charges of terrorism, and that's the first. Is that correct? Yes, yes Mr. We're using President. terrorism, which gives us extra strength. In New York and Nevada, 21 MS-13 members and leaders have been indicted on charges, including murder, kidnapping, and drug trafficking. The DOJ has also announced that it will seek the death penalty for a bloodthirsty MS-13 leader responsible for the despicable killing of seven Americans, including two teenage girls. And then he went on to say this in the Oval Office break, cut number two. But we have other cities that are out of control. They're like war zones. And if the city isn't going to straighten it out of local politicians, all in this case, I don't say this for political reasons, they're all Democrats. They're liberal, left-wing Democrats. And it's almost like they think this is going to be this way forever. We're in Chicago. 68 people were shot and 18 died last week. We're not going to put up with that. We're not going to put up with that. That's a uh, law and order message, obviously. Hey, also, the virus is on everyone's mind. I want to remind everyone, go to flattenthefear.com. It's the website put together by our sponsor, the Job Creators Network. And they want everyone to reopen. We got some great productivity numbers in June. People are afraid they're going to fall off in July because of the reclosing of California. They might, they might not. I think there's a lot of... of, um, that we closed down 100%, we're reopening uh, 75%, then we're back down to 50%. There's a lag in those numbers, might show up in August. But I, I am hoping that even though we see a lot more virus, we also see a lot fewer deaths per uh, number of viruses as we did in the height of March and April.